Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Kinseth, Director of Education at the Meadows Museum, and I'm so glad you've all taken time to join us for the lecture today. So this Sunday, February 20th, the Meadows Museum's newest exhibition, Mario, Picturing the Prodigal Son, opens to the public. And to kick this off, we're thrilled to present today's lecture by Dr. Aoife Brady, titled From Seville to Dublin, The Journey of Mario's Prodigal Son Series. Aoife Brady is the curator of Italian and Spanish art at the National Gallery of Ireland. Brady holds a doctorate in the history of art from Trinity College Dublin and has held curatorial roles with the National Gallery of London and the paintings department of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Her primary research interests relate to the study of painting techniques, materials, and artist studio practices with a focus on 17th century Italy and Spain. Brady's recent curatorial projects have included an exhibition of work by Valencian painter Joaquin Soroya entitled Soroya, Spanish Master of Light, which was a collaboration with the National Gallery of London, and an in-focus exhibition of Bartolome Esteban Murillo's series of paintings depicting the parable of the prodigal son. Brady is currently working on a large-scale exhibition examining the work of Lavinia Fontana scheduled to open in Dublin in May 2023. So it is my pleasure to now bring you her lecture, which again is titled From Seville to Dublin, The Journey of Murillo's Prodigal Son series. Hello and welcome. My name is Aoife Brady and I'm the curator of Italian and Spanish art at the National Gallery of Ireland. It's a great privilege for me to speak with you all today in celebration of the inaugural visit of Murillo's Prodigal Son series to the United States. I'm sorry that circumstances haven't allowed me to be with you in person, but after such an enjoyable and fruitful collaboration with the Meadows, I'm confident that I will have many reasons to visit you in Dallas in the future. Before I begin to talk to you about these compelling paintings, I'd like to say a word about your late director, Dr. Mark Roglan, without whom this exhibition and its associated publication would not have been possible. All of us at the National Gallery of Ireland were extremely saddened by the news of Dr. Roglan's passing, and we'd like to extend our sincere sympathies to his family and to the wider Meadows community. When I first discussed the possibility of bringing the National Gallery of Ireland's six Murillos to Dallas, with Dr. Amanda Dotset in 2019, I was met with immediate enthusiasm from both Dr. Dotset and Dr. Roglan, whose generosity of spirit and eagerness for scholarly collaboration were clear right from the outset. Dr. Roglan visited us in Dublin in September of that year to see the Murillos and to discuss the project. And it's not every day that one meets a director of Dr. Roglan's level of experience who continues to find joy and excitement in his everyday work. His energy was contagious and looking at those old master paintings with a scholar, scholar of his calibre was really a rare treat. He and Dr. Dotset visited us again in February of 2020 for a study day and a dinner celebrating the opening of Dublin's Murillo exhibition and it became clear that in the meadows we had found more than just collaborators on this international tour but true devotees of Spanish painting and generous friends. This project is among the last that Dr. Roglan worked on and it has been a great privilege to have known him and to have collaborated with him. Along with the inevitable bumps in the road associated with planning an exhibition, the Meadows have had to contend not only with the extensive disruption caused by a global pandemic, but also with this major personal loss. In the face of it all, the staff at the Meadows have remained unwaveringly calm, professional, supportive and positive. This steadfastness is a credit to the entire team at the Meadows, but in particular to Dr. Amanda Dotset, who has both led the institution through this difficult period and curated this beautiful exhibition. I'm glad that together, despite the obstacles, we could bring these paintings to Dallas in Mark's memory and that now, as a scholarly community, we can look to continuing the work that Dr. Roglan initiated during his lifetime. In thinking about his rich legacy, I was reminded of the words of Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who once posed the poignant question, Since when are the first line and the last line of any poem where the poem begins and ends? 
And so we go on. In February of 2020, Murillo's cycle of six paintings illustrating the biblical story of the prodigal son went on display together in the National Gallery of Ireland for the first time in 30 years. The reasons for the hiatus in the display of these works are numerous and in part relate to their recent history and the circumstances of their donation to Ireland's national collection. In an informal stipulation associated with the gift of these paintings to the gallery in 1987, their former owners, the Byte family, requested that the works return to their grand country home annually. And this tradition required the works to be packed and transported by rural roads to Rusborough House, a Palladian mansion in County Wicklow, which is about an hour south of Dublin. This arrangement was maintained every summer until 2002 and so offered only very short windows of time in which the gallery could display all six Murillos together. This regular travel, combined with centuries of accumulated dirt and historic damage, as well as yellowed varnished and, and age, ageing retouchings from previous restoration campaigns, left Murillo's compositions obscured and somewhat difficult to read. And therefore, when they ceased their annual travels around 2002, the, the works were put in storage until such a point as they could be properly conserved. Then in 2012, the gallery embarked on an extensive conservation project to address the painting's issues, and this was spearheaded by my colleague Myrna Leiden, who worked on the series intensively for almost a decade. And you can find more information on this conservation project and the discoveries made therein in an essay authored by Myrna in the catalogue published by The Meadows to celebrate this exhibition, and a very fine catalogue it is. So the project, as you can see from this image, proved truly transformative and allowed us once again to appreciate the vibrant palette and masterful brushwork of this 17th century virtuoso painter. Now, Murillo's cycle depicting the parable of the prodigal son is truly one of the gems of the National Gallery of Ireland's collection. And during this lecture, I hope to bring you on a journey exploring the six compositions, their colourful histories, their mysterious origin, and their journey from Seville to Dublin, in the hopes that I might give you a sense of their paramount importance within Murillo's oeuvre and the high regard in which they have been held by their various owners through the centuries. So before we continue, a very brief introduction to the artist who, given how well represented in the Meadows collection he is, many of you will already know quite well. Bartolomé Esteban was born into a well-respected civilian family as the youngest of 14 children in 1617, and he was baptised in Seville on the 1st of January 1618. His parents, barber surgeon Gaspar Esteban and his wife Maria Perez, both passed away before Bartolomé reached 10 years old, at which point he became a ward of his older sister Anna and later adopted his maternal grandmother's surname, Murillo. Around 1630, when he was still a young boy of just 12 or 13, Murillo entered the studio of prominent civilian painter Juan, de, de, Juan del Castillo to train as an apprentice. The years that followed saw that teenage boy evolve into an artist of considerable merit, and by 1645, so around 15 years after he commenced his artistic training, Murillo began working on his first major commission as an independent artist, that is, 11 canvases for the Claustro Chico of the Monastery of San Francisco el Grande, the largest of its kind in Seville. It was at this time that he painted this brilliant, this astounding work depicting a monastic kitchen in which you can see here a Franciscan friar levitates in ecstatic prayer. Just a few years after that, in 1649, a plague hit Seville and it halved the city's population in just months. This was quickly followed by widespread famine, so absolute disaster for the city. And several of Seville's leading painters, including Francisco de Zerberan, abandoned the city for the court of Madrid at, just at this point. Murillo, however, remained in Seville and he continued to build on the success that he had achieved with private patrons and collectors whose fortunes had remained largely uninterrupted by the events of preceding years. So Murillo really took advantage of this situation. By the 1660s then, Mur Murillo was at the height of his career and he was very busy. He was occupied with major commissions 
for Seville's Church of Santa Maria La Blanca, for the local Capuchin monastery, and for the Church of the Brotherhood of Charity. Now, there's no documentary evidence available pertaining to the origin of our six paintings, and so the Prodigal Son series has been dated to this prolific decade, to the 1660s, based on their distinctive palette and brushwork. So all six of the paintings display the fluid handling, the masterful sfumato, and the luminous palette that we associate with Murillo's artistic maturity, his technique having achieved a certain refinement following a visit to Madrid's court late in 1658. The identity of the patron of the cycle remains unknown, and we'll explore this in a little more detail later, but first I'd like to introduce you to the six paintings and to tell you a little bit about what makes them exceptional. Now, though these paintings count themselves among a succession of important local commissions that were completed by Murillo in the 1660s, the Prodigal Son series exhibits unique features among this group. Serial illustrations of religious subjects, such as the parable of the prodigal son, are really quite uncommon in 17th century Spanish art, and during a time during which painters more frequently restricted their biblical narratives to just a single scene. Even more rare than that are complete series that survive intact. So many of these cycles have been dispersed since their creation, uh, or today survive only in fragmentary form. So the National Gallery of Ireland's Prodigal Son series is, in fact, the only intact narrative cycle by Murillo and one of two narrative cycles that the artist ever made. The six compositions that make up the series are each identical in size and present as a unified story, almost a comic strip. And in the words of Ignacio Hermoso Romero in the catalogue for the re recent Murillo centenary exhibition in Seville, this series marked a moment in which, in contrast to the artist's usual approach, Murillo prioritised the conception of the whole over the individuality or prominence of specific figures. Furthermore, then, the National Gallery of Ireland's Prodigal Son is the first ever serial representation of the parable in Spanish art. And though this parable was, by the 17th century, considered one of the most popular pictorial themes in Northern Europe, it was largely underrepresented on the Iberian Peninsula. So just two of Murillo's six canvases had precedent in Spain. Only two had been addressed by Spanish artists before Murillo, and that was the prodigal's repentance and the penitent son's return to his father. Murillo is therefore considered to be the first Spanish artist to have illustrated the other four scenes which complete the prodigal son series. That is, the prodigal son receiving his portion, the departure of the prodigal son, the prodigal son feasting and the prodigal son driven out. This series showcases Murillo's storytelling abilities at their absolute best. Across the six canvases, the artist recounts the New Testament parable of the prodigal son, setting the biblical narrative in his native Seville. Now, the story of the prodigal son, as recounted in the Gospel of Luke, is in fact the most frequently illustrated biblical parable in Western art. It's a 22-verse account that explores themes that were very popular in post tridentine Europe, that is, virtue and vice, sin and repentance, extravagance and thrift, sexual license and spiritual salvation. The parable, of course, tells the tale of a wayward youth, the younger of two sons, who requests his share of the family estate before leaving home and naively squandering his money on extravagant and debaucherous living. The Gospel account is short and contains minimal descriptive details, and this provided the artist with the creative freedom, so to speak, to develop and embellish his narrative to great effect. The result in Murillo's case is a unified cycle that begins with the prodigal's father pr prematurely releasing inheritance to his son and culminating with the dramatic return of the son into the open arms of his merciful parent. The first scene of Murillo's series takes place in a dimly lit interior. And here we see the prodigal's sister and his elder brother gather around their elderly seated father. The patriarch watches with an expression of concern as his wayward son prematurely collects his inheritance from a pile of gold and silver coins on a table in front of him. A ray of light enters at the left through an opening flanked by classical pilasters, and this illuminates the faces of the brother and father 
and sets the prodigal's face in dramatic profile, a dramatic silhouette against the dark background. The solemn nature of this scene is read from both the expressions of the characters and from the artist's muted palette, which in this image is dominated largely by browns and blacks. And then a glimmer of tears appears in the elderly father's eyes as he begins to open his left hand and you can see him tentatively reaching for his son, whose gaze remains fixed on his money. The father's other hand rests on a stack of papers and these are presumably those that have just been signed to release a portion of his estate prematurely to his young son. The prodigal's elder brother, who's not present, present until much later in the biblical account, stands protectively here behind his father and looks at his brother with a disappointed and unreciprocated gaze. A, a swath of drapery painted in a vibrant shade of red frames the top right of the composition here. And this is a nod to the scarlet cloak worn by the prodigal in the next scene, which illustrates his departure from his home. So here in the second episode of Murillo's series, a well-dressed prodigal waves a feathered hat to his parents and his siblings as he prepares jauntily to depart from his family home on horseback. As in the prodigal son receiving his portion, here you can see the father gently outstretching a hand to his son, bidding him maybe to stay. The inclusion of the prodigal's mother and sister, again not mentioned in the biblical narrative, adds to the emotion of the scene. and Both are really clearly pained by the young man's decision to leave. His green costume uh, underneath that red cloak points to the influence of local theatre scripts and this is something I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. Murillo again includes the prodigal's brother in this episode but he delineates him completely from the rest of the group. Here he's closer to the picture plane, closer to the viewer, he's illuminated more brightly and although he's holding a handkerchief in his right hand, his left is placed defiantly on his hip and he appears more unimpressed than sad. And so this is a reference to the brother's resentment and this is an episode which concludes the gospel account but's not, but is not represented by Murillo in his painted series. The dedication of an entire composition to the departure of the prodigal son is quite unusual and Murillo's predecessors occasionally included it in the background of the preceding scene or would it just omit it entirely from the story. Murillo's third painting of the series then illustrates the careless spending and amoral behaviour that led to the prodigal's ultimate demise. Set in a partly covered courtyard, the fruits of the young man's frivolous spending are literally showcased right across the canvas. He's dressed in an elaborate costume and sits at this table, surrounded by servants, courtesans and musician, and a feast is served to him in ornate silverware. Now some of this silverware, interestingly, uh, corresponds to civilian metalwork designs of the period, including the little bell-shaped salt cellar that you can see sitting prominently in the centre of the table. And this lends a distinct local character to the biblical narrative that would have been instantly recognisable to his audience in Seville. A closer look at the prodigal shows one of his arms wrapping around a woman's sh shoulder while he takes a glass of wine from a tray with the other hand. And then the red drapery that we saw in the first two scenes appears again here in the upper left hand corner, though it seems crumpled and its, coloured is, its colour is kind of muddied. And this maybe signifies the beginning of the end for the prodigal and his debaucherous living. So this scene, as I mentioned earlier on, marks the first time that the theme of the fall of the prodigal son was ever addressed by a Spanish painter. Depictions of the prodigal son feasting were common in, Europe in other European countries in the 17th century and they were particularly pervasive in Dutch and Flemish art where the subject was frequently exploited for its erotic possibilities, um, as you can see here in works by Gabriel Metzu and Gerrit van Honthorst. Murillo's approach, however, is comparably restrained. Now, in the absence of native pictorial inspiration for this unprecedented scene, Murillo drew inspiration from multiple sources, both foreign and domestic, including local theatre scripts and Northern European prints. He avoids, however, the likes of Pietro Testa's printed interpretation, which depicts the prodigal partly undressed and in bed with the courtesans, although he does refer to other episodes from Testa's Prodigal Son series, particularly The Departure 
and the return and this series is on display uh, in the Meadows exhibition so you can go and see those prints for yourself. Instead Murillo turns to a slightly more restrained European print for inspiration in the development of the structure of his prodigal feasting like this one by Jack Callot. Though in Murillo's rendition he reduces Callot's party from a raucous crowd to a small intimate gathering and he restricts the alcohol depicted to just a singular glass of wine. This solo glass of wine held by the prodigal in this scene points to another of the artist's sources. While this was unusual as we said and unprecedented in fact as a painted subject in Spain, the parable of the prodigal son was one of the most common themes in contemporary auto sacramentales. This was a genre of Spanish dramatic literature that re reached its peak popularity during the 1600s, during the artist's lifetime. And Murillo demonstrates keen awareness of the golden age stage in his paintings. So in the absence of native pictorial options, he appears to draw directly instead from Spanish theater scripts. This lone glass of wine carries special symbolic value in, the the in, a, in a theatrical script for one such 17th century stage performance of the prodigal son as the wine of forgetfulness which robs the young man of his inhibitions and encourages his demise. And so this emphasizes the role of alcohol in the prodigal's downfall. And these specific and yet subtle allusions to local theater are really rife in the prodigal sun cycle. We saw one earlier on in that green costume that the prodigal wore on his departure from his home. Now, the prodigal son driven out, well, this painting is the most dynamic and perhaps dramatic of the series. In the absence of any description of this event in Luke's Gospel, Murillo seems to really enjoy staging it himself. And this painting too suggests the influence of local theatre. Well, here, like characters in a play, the figures are arranged on a singular plane and the arch architecture behind them acts as a backdrop as they act out a scene with props and expressive gestures. The prodigal inheritance now spent, angry courtesans with fur furrowed brows are seen chasing the prodigal from a brothel and they lunge towards him with brooms and an alarmingly sharp spear while a man in black with a large sword assists them with the job. The young man now wearing ragged clothing and holes in his shoes, he's shown here in full flight with one foot lifted as he runs away with his arms in the air and he chances this brilliant, cursory, cheeky glance back towards his pursuers. Murillo's interpretation of this scene's scene takes several cues again from Jack Callot's print of the same subject in the gesture of the woman uh, and the barking dog, though a significant deviation lies in the doorway of the brothel. And I've adjusted the brightness of this image just so you can see it a little bit better on screen, but here in the shadows is an aged woman, presumably the madam of the brothel, who stands with her index finger raised. And the inclusion of this madame or procuress who stares directly into the eyes of the prodigal in the depiction of the prodigal son's dismissal, dismissal from the brothel is exceptional in Western art. He, she usually does not appear in this scene of expulsion. Her presence here might refer to the young man's designagno which was his disillusionment, his spiritual awakening. This was the turning point in the narrative in which the sinner is disillusioned by material and carnal pleasures and awoken to the error of his ways. And this immediately re preceded repentance. So like the prodigal feasting, Murillo has cleansed this scene to some extent in keeping with civilian sensibilities. The women don't look like uh, women of the night, I suppose. He's covered them up and stripped them of their jewellery and thereby he conforms to a law that was enacted during the reign of Philip II and reissued again in 1640 which prohibited prostitutes from wearing gold or silk or pearls beyond the doorways of their establishments. Now the prodigal son feeding swine. Well, this is the only of the six paintings in which the son is shown in isolation. The parable recounts that after the prodigal had spent everything that he had, a severe famine ravaged the country that he was in and he was forced to seek work from a farmer who sent him out to the fields to feed pigs. So here we see him kneeling alone in a barren landscape with his eyes thrown upward to heaven. 
And this illustration of the prodigal's destitution is very much reminiscent of the kind of penitent, penitent saints in the wilderness that pervaded 17th century Spanish and Italian painting. The bleak atmospheric landscape that stretches out behind him is painted with this limited but very evocative palette of pastel browns and greens and blues. And then the ruinous walls in the background around him emphasise the destitution of the land and the prodigal's excommunication from society. And although the artist provides no human companionship for the sinner, six hairy hogs accompany him in his darkest hour. And these appear to be black Iberian pigs. These are a native domesticated breed from which the prized Hamon Iberico is still produced today. The healthy animals are shown here feeding from a trough, which according to the parable actually incited jealousy in the desperate and starving prodigal. And it was at this very moment that he chose to return home. And in this instance, Murillo had a rich pictorial tradition from which to draw. This was a subject that was addressed frequently by other artists of the period outside Spain and by Murillo himself in a painting which is today in the collection of the Hispanic Society of America and also on display in this exhibition. But he refers directly to printed material, including works by German Renaissance master Albert Dürer, and then again to his old favourite Jacques Callot. In the sixth and final painting of the series, Murillo illustrates the moment in which the repentant prodigal is reunited with his family. Returning to the steps from which the prodigal bid farewell to his hometown in the second scene, here a group waits to welcome him back. And the penitent son, now draped in rags, kneels before his merciful father, who bends to meet him and envelops him in this warm embrace. Here you can see the sinner's mother, who looks wearily over the shoulder of her husband, and her expression is a sort of a mixture of relief, but also exhaustion. Murillo captures the moment of intense emotion as the son locks eyes with his father, and his clasped hands and his forlorn eyes expression expressing a genuine sorrow and regret. Murillo includes details in the composition that make direct reference to the biblical narrative, which recounts that in celebration of the son's return, the prodigal's father called forth servants to clothe him. And here you can see one in the background in the, in the, in the left-hand side, who is carrying a deep blue robe painted with an expensive ultramarine pigment as a material expression of sorts uh, to, to signify the significance of this gesture. The father also in the Bible requests a fatted calf to be slaughtered for the celebration and here you can see one led through a doorway in the distant background on the right hand side. Murillo's decision to conclude the parable with the prodigal's return is however an absolute deviation from the biblical narrative which continues with an episode dealing or detailing the elder son's resentment of his younger brother. The artist alludes to the true biblical finale only in the inclusion of the brother at the extreme left who is looking on at the reunion with what I can only describe as a sullen expression. Murillo returned to this subject late in the 1660s in a larger painting for the Hospital de la Caridad in Seville, which is now in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC and on display along alongside Dublin series for the very first time in this exhibition at the Meadows. The original owner of Dublin's six paintings is not known, and this has formed the subject of considerable scholarly debate for many decades. We have no extant documentary evidence from the 1600s that can be firmly linked to this series of paintings, and so much of what's been written in the past pertaining to the origin of the series has been somewhat theoretical. Now, during the course of the National Gallery of Ireland's recent conservation and research project, we had an opportunity to look back on these various theories pertaining to the origin of the paintings and to reconsider their plausibility in light of new technical information on the series. The peculiarities and the rarity of the artist's subject choice and his iconography suggest that Murillo may have been influenced in his creation of these works by the original commissioner of the series. And since the subject matter of this cycle, which is treated in some depth, was absolutely unique at the time in the history of Spanish art, 
Its creation and its composition may therefore have been motivated by the specific desires, the specific wants of whoever requested it. The theory that Murillo's break from tradition in the serialization of this parable, as well as the, in the pictorial language that he used, may have originated from the patron of the series is a notion that has some precedent. 17th century Spanish patrons often dictated the design, the subject matter, and the iconography of artworks that they commissioned. And indeed, the many unique features of these paintings may provide clues as to the identity of their patron. The feature most relevant to the argument of, argument of patronage has been Murillo's inclusion of prostitutes in two of his six scenes, the prodigal son feasting and the prodigal son driven out. Now, the inclusion of courtesans in a painting was rare in the artist Uve and unique in a religious context. So the prostitutes in the Prodigal Son series find parallels only in Murillo's genre scenes, which in, them, in themselves are not plentiful, like four figures on a step uh, from the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth nearby, and two women at a whim window, again, from, from the collection of the National Gallery of Art, or today in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., now, even then, the profession of the women depicted in these paintings is only presumed. They lack the recognisable and well-known pictorial tradition associated with the parable of the prodigal son, which allows us to identify their professions with absolute certainty. Now, indeed, the representation of courtesans in Spanish painting was highly unusual in the wake of the Catholic Counter-Reformation, at a time when the ill effects of viewing unchaste scenes were emphasised. Texts published by important artist writers of Murillo's day make these risks very clear to painters. So in 1649, Francisco Pacheco described the grave danger that Christian painters caused to their souls and to those of other men by painting erotic figures or st stories which incite sensuality. But there's absolutely no ambig ambiguity regarding the identity of those women depicted in the prodigal son feasting and the prodigal son driven out, which follow a very standardised pictorial interpretation that, although it was new to Spain, was quite well established elsewhere in Europe at this time. The appearance of these women in the prodigal son series has led some scholars of the past, or in the past, to believe that the person who commissioned these paintings was perhaps foreign to Spain. In her writings on the series in 1992, for example, Mindy Taggart inferred from the inclusion of sex workers in Murillo's paintings that the patron of the series was likely, and I quote, a foreigner exempt from most Spanish restrictions. And then she notes that alien residents of Seville were not constrained by the same laws of decorum as were their Spanish neighbours. And yes, certainly, the artist had non-native patrons. Murillo's output comprises not only those works that were commissioned by Seville's local religious institution and other private clients, but also those that he produced for wealthy foreign clients, many of whom of Flemish or Italian origin that resided in the city and in nearby Cadiz. However, artists didn't have a get-out-of-jail-free card that allowed them to paint whatever they wanted just because they were painting for a non-Spanish client. In fact, in a treatise written in the early 1700s, Antonio Palomino outlined the penalties for the violation of these rules of decorum w with respect to painting and subject matter. And these included, apparently, excommunication, fines and exile. That being said, according to the writer, such penalties were to be imposed on the creator of an artwork, not on the commissioner. And as such, it seems that it was artists who were subject to these restrictions on their subject matter, not their patrons. And this therefore weakens the claim that a foreigner would necessarily have been better positioned somehow to commission the Prodigal Son series than a native Spaniard might have been. Now that is, of course, unless the works happen to be created for export uh, and that, you know, they would never have been seen by a Spanish audience. But in this case, we have no record of the Prodigal Son series uh, leaving Spain until the 19th century. So we can, I think, presume that they were created for a Spanish patron or for a patron that was residing in Spain. So then, if an artist was the person that was bound by these rules rather than his customer, Murillo had to take full responsibility for his subject matter. And though the illustration of prostitutes in a biblical context might indeed have upset civilian sensibilities, 
The extent to which the advice and punishments that were recounted by early sources like Palomino were enforced on artists really remains unclear. Uh, there's no evidence, documentary evidence, of the imposition of fines or otherwise on artists that is, it has not been found to this day. So we don't really know how strictly these rules were enforced. The possibility then that the patron of the Prodigal Son series was Spanish remains open. And there are several factors to my mind that support the theory that they were indeed a Spaniard. Among these is the fact that, as we noted earlier, the sex workers in Murillo's paintings are de depicted fully clothed and rather demure, which would have been rather a rather restrained approach for foreign pa patrons who would have been familiar perhaps with more raunchy interpretations of the parable, like some of those that we saw earlier on. Murillo's attention to prevailing values of decorum in 17th century Spain led him to paint, or led him to lend an unusual air of modesty to these scenes that were described as wild in the biblical parable. And, you know, he brings them closer to what might have been deemed appropriate for a civilian patron, particularly one who might have commissioned them for a private residence. Technical analysis of the paintings has also offered supporting evidence for the argument in favour of a local patron. Despite the care that Murillo took in his depictions of prostitution in the prodigal son feasting and the prodigal son driven out, it would seem that both paintings might have still been considered offensive by some. Technical imaging reveals that both of these compositions suffered substantial losses to their paint layers. So here on the upper left hand corner you can see an x-ray of the prodigal son feasting and the lower right hand corner you can see a photograph of the prodigal son driven out uh, mid conservation treatment. So during these conservation treatment these, these damages presented as vertical strips of damage running through the centres of the compositions and only the prodigal son feasting and the prodigal son driven out exhibit these damages. No other, no such losses have been noted on the other four works so the others have uh, no uh, indication that they have this kind of damage at all. And these damages suggest that these two paintings were removed from their wooden stretchers and rolled at some point quite early in their histories, while the other four were left absolutely undisturbed. Now, since these are the only two paintings in the series that depict sex workers, it may very well be the case that they were removed from display for periods of time due to their immodest or perceptibly immodest subject matter. When we then consider that these potentially offensive images of courtesans might have been hidden from sight quite early in their histories, their subject matters no longer conflict with the theory that they could have been commissioned by a civilian native. Now, issues of decorum aside, I think that it's difficult to marry the idea of a foreign patron with other elements of the iconography in each of the six paintings that make up the prodigal son, because without doubt, one of Murillo's greatest visual sources for this series was what he saw around him, contemporary life in Seville. Now the artist did, did of course, as we've seen, refer to foreign pictorial sources, but only in the absence of Spanish variants. And again, as we observed earlier, he reworked these sources in keeping with civilian tastes by imbuing his compositions with elements that are quintessentially Spanish. So then we're left with the question, who could Murillo's client have been? Though in the latter part of his career, many of Murillo's patrons were of Italian or Flemish origin, his clients remained principally, principally civilian. Again, in the absence of documentary evidence, it's difficult to single out a specific local customer as a potential recipient of the Prodigal Son series, but it's certainly worth exploring a suggestion that has been posited by scholars of the past and I find rather convincing. That is, that the person responsible for this commission was a man named Miguel de Meñara, who during Murillo's lifetime became president of the Charitable Brotherhood of the Caridad in Seville. The infamous, infamous life story of Don Miguel de Meñara demonstrates key alignment with that of the prodigal son. Born into a wealthy family, as a youth, Meñara notoriously led a life of debauchery and excess, the worst of the worst, essentially. And following the premature death of his sister and his two elder brothers when he was just a child, and then the passing of his father in 1648, Maniara found himself quite quickly the head of his family at just 21 years old. Tragically, his mother died four years later, and 
With this newfound responsibility on his shoulders, Maniara reportedly married, repented, and completely reformed his former lifestyle, devoting his time and his money entirely to charitable work. Very tragically, in 1661, his young wife then died, sending him deeper into self-reflection. And at that point, he applied for membership to the Brotherhood of, the, of Charity on the 8th of September, 1662. And although the Brotherhood was originally hesitant to accept him because of his reputation, by 1663, not only had he become a member, but he had been unanimously elected as president of the Caridad. So this is the absolute ultimate story of a reformed sinner. The notion that Miguel de Meniara might have prescribed a subject matter or iconography linked to his own biography to an artist from whom he commissioned work is not one without precedent. It's generally accepted, for example, that details of Juan de Valdez Leal's two paintings, The Hieroglyphs of the Four Last Things, which were commissioned by Maniara for the Brotherhood's Chapel, that, that, that this was all determined or predetermined by Maniara. So passages in Maniara's book, The Discourse on Truth, uh, dated 1671, align incredibly closely with Valdez Leal's monumental works, with, with, with what's, what we can see in these paintings. And this book has been used to firmly establish Maniara as the author of the two paintings' iconography. It's been recognised as well that to some extent the iconography that Maniara prescribed for the hieroglyphs, it reflects his personal obsession with death, having suffered the untimely loss of his entire family. It's not beyond the realms of thinking, therefore, that Maniara could have commissioned paintings of subjects with which he felt some kind of personal connection, like the parable of the prodigal son. In the case of Murillo's six canvases, it seems that the biblical narrative may have been, a, been adjusted somewhat to better align with Maniara's own life story. The biblical account of the prodigal son, as we've said before, it concludes by detailing the resentment of the prodigal's elder brother, who's jealous of the generous treatment afforded to his wayward brother upon his return. But Murillo doesn't focus on this element of the narrative, despite depicting other unusual, unprecedented scenes. So perhaps again, this is a relevant to patronage. You know, if indeed Maniara is the person depicted in the series, it may be that this part of the parable's theme seemed irrelevant or inappropriate uh, to, to Maniara's own life story, given the untimely death of his own brother. Similarly then, the unusual presence of the prodigal's mother and sister in some of the compositions, which has proved puzzling to scholars, might be related to Maniara's own family. The inclusion of the prodigal siblings and his mother in certain scenes de deviates not only from the biblical narrative, but also from many of the visual and literary sources to which the artist appears to refer. So these figures, therefore, might again be based on Don Miguel's lost relatives. It's also quite unusual that Murillo devotes an entire composition to the prodigal son driven out, and this might again point to Maniara's life story. So here again we meet on the left-hand side, in the shadows, the aged procuress staring menacingly into the eyes of the prodigal son. And as previously mentioned, this, uh, this figure is <clears throat> unique to Murillo's retelling of this specific part of the parable and has been taken to represent the moment of the prodigal's disillusionment and subsequent spiritual awakening. So perhaps this is a reference to the dramatic turn that Maniara's own behaviour reportedly took an awakening that, by all accounts, was really dramatic and intense. It's not only Maniara's biography that links him to the Prodigal Son series. Murillo himself applied to join the Brotherhood of Charity in 1660, but he waited a full five years for acceptance, since, as a painter, his social status did not make him a desirable candidate to this wealthy and uh, aristocratic group. But the fact that he was eventually admitted may have been down to Maniara himself, Maniara's support. The president knew Murillo. Um, Murillo and Maniara met in 1650 and Maniara became godfather to Murillo's son, Jose. And in his capacity as the Brotherhood's president, Maniara was responsible for initiating a major building campaign for the organisation, uh, which included the construction of a hospice, a hospital and a chapel. And shortly after his acceptance as a member of the Caridad, 
Murillo was commissioned to paint eight works for this chapel, for this newly built chapel, depicting the acts of charity which he began in 1667. So he had waited that full f five years from 1660 to 1665 uh, to be accepted as a member of the Caridad and then he gets this major, major commission in 1667. What's interesting about that is that stylistically the Prodigal Son series can be dated to the years immediately preceding the works for the Caridad Chapel, one of which, as we noted earlier, also illustrated the return of the Prodigal Son. The comparative rapidity with which Murillo painted Dublin's Prodigal Son series, which is really evident in the fluid application of paint and exposed ground layers, um, versus the highly finished surfaces of the, of the paintings for the Caridad Chapel, suggests that Murillo may have painted them quickly for Maniara in an effort to impress him or maybe to impress the Brotherhood as a whole, either to win this major commission or to gain their favour and thereby entry to the con confraternity. Now finally, Maniara's appearance could also be used to support or has been used to support his identification as the patron of the series. In her 1987 catalogue of Spanish paintings in the NGI collection, Rosemary Mulcahy observes that Maniara's portrait by Valdez Leal, which I showed you a little earlier, shows a man, and I quote, with similar, if older, features to Murillo's prodigal son. Now this likeness, I would say, is readily apparent and again leaves us wondering if Murillo indeed used Maniara as a model for his young prodigal. The final question that needs to be addressed in this context is that of why no documentary evidence pertaining to the origin of the six works has been discovered. If these paintings were indeed a personal commission made by Maniara or a gift from the artist, it is entirely possible that they weren't known to the wider community in Spain or recorded in inventories. Their size, which is considerably smaller than those made for the Caridad Chapel, for example, suggest that they were destined for, pri for a private domestic space, so someone's private home, and were probably not on public view in the years following their creation, thereby remaining largely unknown to the masses. Now, though we may never be able to determine the original location of these paintings with absolute certainty, it's important that we don't infer from this lack of documentation a lack of importance and the series later provenance, which saw it in the possession of a host of illustrious owners, attests to the high regard in which these works were held through subsequent centuries of their history. Having outlined a theory regarding their origin, I'd like to conclude my lecture today by telling you, just in brief, the story of the painting's more recent history, which is really quite extraordinary, and it'll explain to those of you who are curious how six Spanish masterpieces ended up in grey and rainy Dublin. We can really only theorise about the location of the paintings in the 17th and 18th centuries, and it's not until around 1800, almost 120 years after the artist's death, that we can determine the ownership of Murillo's prodigal son paintings with absolute certainty. So they were at this point, around 1800, in the collection of the fifth Marquis Dinaros in Zarus. A series of letters that was recently published by Pedro Martinez Plaza demonstrates that from 1846, if not before, the works had been transferred to the possession of a local uh, resident of Aspetia in the Basque country, from whom they were then acquired by a young and enthusiastic Federico di Madrazzo, who was an artist who, like his father Jose, would later become a director of the Museo del Prado. Eager to impress his father, a young Federico purchased the works while he was on holiday in northern Spain. And his father advised him quite cleverly not to, and I quote, I quote here, not to speak with anyone about the matter so that other one, others would not know about the opportunity. So telling him essentially to keep his valuable find a secret from other collectors. It was important that he didn't let anybody know about this treasure. And Federico indeed negotiated a low price for the paintings by concealing his interest in the beautiful and valuable objects. Federico decided to put all six of the paintings up for sale in 1852 and he sold The Return of the Prodigal Son to King Francisco de Assis in 1854. And so The Return was at that point separated from the rest of the series. Documents of the Times tell us that the painting was purchased specifically 
as a gift to be given from Queen Isabel II to Pope Pius IX. And indeed, shortly after King Francisco purchased the painting from Madrazzo, the Spanish royals presented the return of the prodigal son to Pope, Pope Pius IX and the painting travelled to Rome. There's two wax Vatican seals visible on the reverse of this painting. And of the six works, I suppose it seems clear why this might have been chosen as a gift for the Vatican. It depicts the dramatic culmination of the parable and it, con it, it conveys this paternal forgiveness at its very fullest. But that such a painting was considered worthy as a diplomatic gift from a queen, the Queen of Spain, to a pope is testament to the value ascribed to the painting at this time. About two years later, around 1856, the remaining five paintings from the series, less The Return of the Prodigal Son, which was in the Vatican, were purchased from Federico de Madrazo by a wealthy politician and businessman, José de Salamanca, who was later the first Marquis of Salamanca. At its height, the Salamanca collection encompassed about 900 paintings and came to be one of the most prestigious and well-known of the 19th century. But this good fortune did not last long for Salamanca. Facing major financial problems, the Marquis sold 237 works from his collection in a huge sale that took place in his private residence in Paris in, on the 6th of June of, six, of 1867. At that point, the five Murillos from the Prodigal Son series, still missing the return, were purchased by William Ward, who was the first Earl of Dudley. Ward was an enthusiastic British art collector who sat on the Board of Trustees for the National Portrait Gallery and the National Gallery in London. The Earl paid double the price, interestingly, for the Prodigal Son feasting from, than for any of the other four works. And this is a nod, I suppose, to its decorative nature and intricate composition, which held some appeal for collectors at the time. Dudley then, determined to reunite the Prodigal Son series, negotiated a deal directly with the Vatican and there's wonderful re uh, letters recording these negotiations. <clears throat> and he obtained the return in exchange for a virgin in glory with Saint Dominic and Catherine of Alexandria by the great Renaissance painter Fra Angelico, a holy family by Bonifacio, <clears throat> and on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, 2,000 gold Napoleons, which was a huge sum for the 19th century. So the value placed on these works by Dudley, or on this specific work by Dudley, or more to the point, I suppose, on the series being intact, is really quite clear. It was fundamentally important to him to have all six of Murillo's works reunited. And the newly intact series was displayed then in his London mansion, Dudley House. In 1896, 11 years after the death of the first Earl, all six Murillo's were paint purchased from the second Earl of Dudley by British gold and diamond magnate, Mr. Alfred Bight, whose business interests were in South Africa, but at that point was a resident of 26 Park Lane in London. And the paintings cost Alfred again a small fortune to purchase, but they quickly became family favourites among the Bights. The paintings were really clearly prized by the Bight family, who went to some lengths to display them. In 1913, Sir Otto Bight, who had inherited the paintings from his brother, Alfred, posed for Irish artist Sir William Orpen in this grand portrait of the collector in his home on Belgrave Square in London. Here Orpen depicts Bight seated in his library, where you can see him surrounded by the Prodigal Son series above his bookcases hung in gilt frames and absolutely dominating the walls. Later on then, the paintings were inherited by Otto's nephew, Sir Alfred Bight, who in 1939 redecorated his entire London home, which was a lavish mansion and the exclusive Kensington Palace Gardens in London, uh, and he renovated it to accommodate the display of his collection. His dining room was, at that point, reworked specifically, reworked, I should say, rebuilt specifically for the Prodigal Son series. So Sir Alfred reconstructed a re rectangular room in its absolute entirety, turning it into a grand oval-shaped space that was lined with pilasters, and he added these tastefully hidden spotlights to illuminate the six Prodigal Son paintings. In 1952, at that point living between London and South Africa for several years, Sir Alfred Bight and his wife Lady Clementine Bight made the decision to begin the search for a new home. 
And luckily for us here in Dublin, although they had no clear ties to the country, the couple decided to settle in Ireland. They read about a home in Country Life magazine, Rustborough House, the ancestral home of the Milltown family in County Wicklow. And without seeing it, they purchased the home, the mansion, from this advertisement. And again, on their arrival to Ireland, Sir Alfred remodelled the house to accommodate his collection and he decorated the dining room again specifically for the display of the Prodigal Son series. In doing so, he removed the 18th century stucco frames which had been created as part of the original architecture of the room, so the Murillos were really quite clearly a priority. After a number of concerning incidents, including a boiler fire in the basement of Rusborough, and while they were still travelling to South Africa annually, usually for the winter months, to get out of the miserable Irish weather, in the 1960s, the Byte family began to think about the long-term safety of their paintings. Lady Byte at that time wrote to the director of the National Gallery of Ireland, James White, asking if they could lend their collection to the gallery for the month of the year that they were overseas. Their concerns for the safety of themselves and their collection grew more acute in 1974, when an IRA gang led by British heiress Rose Dugdale stole 19 paintings from the Byte collection at Rusborough House, including a Vermeer, a Goya, two Gainsboroughs and three Rubens. Thankfully, the scale of the six Prodigal Son paintings was such that they proved too cumbersome a load for the invaders who left the series on the wall intact. A ransom note was sent at that point to James White uh, the director of National Gallery of Ireland, demanding half a million pounds and the release of a number of IRA members from Brixton pr Prison in England. But the Bites did not pay the ransom and Dugdale was apprehended and the stolen paintings mostly recovered 11 days later from a cottage in Baltimore in County Cork. In 1986, the Bites finally made their decision to donate their collection of paintings to the National Gallery of Ireland and the gallery director, Homan, Homan Potterton, recalled that at that point, the family's intentions were a secret that were known only to himself and to the gallery's chair, chairman of the board. But dramatically, before the donation was finalised and while it was still somewhat a secret, Rusborough House was raided again. At that point, all of the paintings had been recovered from Dugdale, restored to the walls of Rusborough, and they had another robbery at 2.30am on the 26th of May 1986. At that point, millions and millions, tens of millions of pounds worth of paintings, including again the Vermeer, Tumetsu's, Goya, were stole by an un stolen by an unrelated Dublin criminal gang who were led by Martin Cahill, who was known locally as the General. The Murillos again remained untouched safely on the walls of Rusborough, but a huge international police operation was mounted to recover the remainder of the collection that was still missing. Now, most were later found in Britain and in Belgium and another in a dramatic sting by police in Turkey where three men were arrested smuggling a Metsu painting into the country. Then in 1987, despite the ongoing investigations into the robbery of some of their most valuable artworks, Sir Alfred and Lady Clementine by generously proceeded with the donation, gifting 17 priceless paintings from their collection at Rusborough to the National Gallery of Ireland. Their donation included their beloved Prodigal Son series <clears throat> and the gift as a whole marked the first time that a gallery had received a donation of paintings of unknown whereabouts with many outstanding works still missing at that point. Now, following their donation to the gallery, the six paintings comprising the, Follery, the Prodigal Son series were lent to Rusborough House, as I said earlier on, annually for their summer opening until 2002. And these were the only works from the Byte family donation to return to Rusborough, again attesting to their special status among a collection of great masterpieces. After almost two decades in storage and conservation, you can imagine what a pleasure it was in 2020, alongside my colleague Myrna Lydon, to return these paintings to the walls of the National Gallery of Ireland in their newly resplendent condition. Like the prodigal son himself, who was lost and is now found, through an intensive conservation process, these gems from the National Gallery of Ireland's collection that were missing from view for so many years were brought back to their public to become favourites once more. So it's an absolute pleasure for me today to see their inaugural visit 
to the United States and to share with their story with you all now. I hope you enjoy the exhibition very much. Thank you for listening and take care. Hello everyone, thank you so much. And um, I, I really appreciate you all listening. I was watching you all, <laughs> those of you with cameras on, it's nice to see faces. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person this, e or this, this evening. It's evening here in Ireland. Um, but please, if you have any questions, please do send them in. I see one really nice question. And Anne, if you're happy enough, I'll just, I'll kick off. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I, I see here that uh, Ed Ferguson has asked, has asked uh, in the chat box about the two paintings that have little yappy dogs in them, which is a really interesting one. He, Ed points out that one is hiding under a table looking sad, and I'll show you these images in a second. And the other in the return of uh, the, the other, the little yappy dog greeting the prodigal son. And Ed asked, do dogs often represent fidelity? And do I have any idea why there's no dog in the final work of the six? Well, absolutely, yes. Dogs do often represent fidelity. And I'm just going to pull these images up so that you can see them. So we have a dog here in the prodigal son feasting, and then we later on see the same little dog again in the prodigal son driven out. Now in this context, I don't think this has anything to do with loyalty or fidelity, because of course we know that one of the, the major flaws uh, that the prodigal son is, is known for is his disloyalty to his family and uh, the fact that he, he left and took his share of inheritance early on. So I don't think in this context, when we see him feasting and uh, enjoying spending said inheritance, that we're, we're seeing the dog as a symbol of loyalty, but rather the dog in this context is often associated with carnal desire. And that makes perfect sense in this scene, um, this, this scene of, of, of love and desire with the prodigal uh, wrapping his arm around a beautiful lady. We see the dog under the table here chewing a bone. Sometimes the dog is also uh, seen as a, as a symbol of greed, which similarly fits very well with this biblical parable. So we see the dog then again, he's <laughs> being ejected from the brothel with the prodigal. Uh, so the carnal desire similarly is being driven out at the same time as the young man himself. And so that's why in, the, in this series, I don't think we see this little dog in the, the prodigal son returning to his home, uh, because in this context, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't represent loyalty. I'm not sure if we have more questions. Forgive me, Anne, I'm just looking for the chat box has disappeared. So if you can... Uh, help me out. I would be very appreciative. You're on mute, Anne. I'm sorry. Thank you. I've also kind of lost my screen. So thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have one question. Let's see that has just come in. Perhaps it's a comment. This is from Terry and I'll just read it verbatim. So she says, it seems that these works have been treasured on more than a materialistic level. The affection of those who own them must have been instrumental in their protection for their families and for the future. Absolutely. I think that's a really nice comment and sort of a question or, or a conversation starter anyway. What I find really remarkable about these paintings, and it's something that is, is unique in Spanish art, oftentimes we see Murillo's popularity, it goes up and down over the centuries. His, his religious works particularly aren't always loved as much as we might appreciate them today. Whereas the Prodigal Son series seems to have been valued and appreciated by people of all different creeds, nationalities, different backgrounds. So, you know, it wasn't just people from Catholic Spain that, that really loved these works because the parable speaks to such a wide and diverse audience. And we see that now in Dublin when we, when we showed these pictures. Everyone who came into the gallery to see them, regardless of, of their own life story, seemed to be able to relate to the parable of the prodigal son in some way. Everybody has a prodigal son or knows a prodigal son. Everybody, you know, can identify with this story of you know, uh, uh, losing your way and then finding it again with the help of your family. So I think it, that, that's what makes them special. And Murillo tells it in such a way that even a 21st century audience can kind of see themselves in the scenes. And we, I think at the Meadows, are just so excited to kind of share all of these works with, with people in Dallas um, to treasure them. So another question has come in. Um, do you know anything about the models Murillo used, particularly those for the sex workers? I, I would be very surprised. Now, it's very difficult for us to say, for to say with any certainty whether, whether he would have used actual women as models for these paintings at all. 
but I doubt it very much in this context. We, we know that Maria, as I said during the lecture, was bound very strictly to rules of decorum and to have used real life models you know, uh, 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 as as models for his sex workers in these scenes would have probably been deemed as inappropriate. It's not like Caravaggio later on, we know, you know, he was taking people off the streets in Naples and, and painting them. And this was something that was seen as, as highly indecorous in Rome. So I think Seville, the idea of using live models for in the in the depiction of courtesans would not have been would have been sort of off limits to the artist to some extent, to some extent. But I, I can't say with absolute certainty, he may have been basing them off the facial features of of women that he knew in the locale that he thought were particularly beautiful, and we do see that in other artist studios where you know they they will they will base their their images of people of, of courtesans or or Cleopatras or Lucretias these 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 women on the most beautiful women of the city, and they become sort of idealized faces that may not necessarily represent any one specific person. Okay, the questions are rolling in now, so. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see, Carolyn is just pointing out um, a similarity she sees, a strong similarity in the composition of the return of the prodigal son with Rembrandt's etched treatment of the subject. And then um, I suppose we're, we're getting just another accolade. We have had many people comment on what a brilliant, remarkable presentation this has been. Extraordinary is what Terry says. You're very kind. I, I'm only sorry that I can't be there with you all in person um, to talk to you all because I'm sure we'd have such fun. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I can, I, I can only say thank you for your generosity. It's a pleasure to be able to send over to you in Texas. Um, with, absolutely. And I think I've only shown you just a few of the prints that we think that Mario uh, has referred to here. So a lot of like... Uh, works by Rembrandt, by Rubens, by the by the Northern Greats. People made etchings after these, and they were widely dispersed in Spain. And we know that a huge quantity of Northern prints were donated to to Seville to to Seville's local library during Murillo's lifetime. So he had access to a massive body of printed material from which to draw and from which to to you know be inspired. And so you know all the time, the more I look at these paintings and the more I see other works you can you can see different uh he, he cherry picks bits and pieces from different northern prints and it's amazing to see the way images are diffused from one end of the continent to another but yeah certainly you'll you'll find you'll find now that you've seen these and you're thinking you're thinking about the prints and um, the more you look at dutch and flemish art you'll see it in murillo well, i think we're going to finish up with one final question that's coming in about the architecture um, is there anything that is, you know, specifically civilian in the architecture or does it speak kind of more generally to architecture in Spain? I, I wish there was something really specific. I, I think that they are all civilian in, in appearance. You know, he's giving that civilian feel. Absolutely. But there we haven't identified any specific building or, or feature that, you know, speaks to one of Seville's great monuments, like La Giralda, for example, that's something that pops up in some Rio paintings. Mm -hmm. Here, he's definitely giving you the sort of civilian vibe, but he's not referring to any one specific place. And I suppose that ambiguity is deliberate because he's he is painting a biblical parable. So he's kind of leaving you somewhere in between. He's giving you a little bit of Seville, but he's not being overly specific because he doesn't want to take you completely out of the of the the the, the origin of the story either. Well, Aoife Brady, thank you so much for all the work you put into presenting this and for joining us here in Dallas um, for the Q&A session. I really hope we're going to be able to get you out to Dallas before the exhibition closes in June. I had a preview of it yesterday and it is stunning. So we do hope you'll get to see it in person. But thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has taken some time out of their afternoon to join us today. We hope to see you at the museum uh, this weekend uh, where you can see these works in person. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for listening and please enjoy the exhibition.